thank you for joining everybody. We're here on our bi-weekly webinar that myself and Jim host every two weeks, and it's here to provide value to you agents. One of Jim's favorite sayings is iron sharpens iron. So we're going to be learning from each other. And this is an exciting topic, you know, that we're going to be covering today. Mastering title commitments, a guide to ensure that your deal can close. You know, my name is Ryan Poole. I'm a real estate agent. I've been at this over 20 years. And a little bit about myself, too, is I launched a company called Real Trade, which is an online marketplace and social media platform for real estate. I tell all the agents, we're the home of the double dip, right? You can create a profile and get free leads off your listings. Imagine that. We have agents right now that are making tens of thousands of extra dollars. So I, I implore you to check out Real Trade. But something that we do on this bi-weekly webinar is we add value to agents. And this, this particular topic on mastering title com commitments and a guide to ensure your deal can close is a big one. You know, this is like even me as an agent doing this for over 20 years, it's like a black box title, right? And you get this title commitment back, right? You're trying to read it and you're trying to have that information so you can share it with your with your buyers or of course if you're representing the seller you know and you want to sound knowledgeable you want to see if there's any issues on the title commitment that you can head off in the past it's amazing that we can have jim you know real estate attorney with how many years now over 30 years jim that you've been in the industry and to I've been doing real estate transactions for 40 i've been a licensed attorney for 20. i mean that's amazing that's amazing jim so we get to share it. So, Jim, why don't you do an intro intro about yourself and all the awesome companies you have? This guy wears a lot of hats, has some amazing companies that he has to help real estate agents. So go it ahead, It takes Jim. teamwork to make the dream work, Brian. It's you and Danny and all of us working together that make it happen. Yeah. Um, the, my goal here is to give you guys content you won't find anyplace else. Like my little intro on Sites or Burnett, my view on Sites or Burnett, I, I challenge you to find that perspective anyplace else, but I think you're going to find that perspective will stay on the test of time. If it does exist somewhere, I'd love to have you text me the article because I haven't heard anybody say it. So my goal is to give you guys information you won't hear anyplace else, unique content that'll set you apart as a, as a competent, you know, as an efficient agent and give you those tools. There's no dumb questions, right? The stuff we're going to talk about, nobody wants to ask if they don't understand, but everybody in the room has the same pain. I guarantee it at one time or another. There's no stupid questions. You can text me. You can raise your hand. If we have a small enough group, we can jump in right now. Or at the end, we can go into depth into any one question, whether it pertains to the topic or any other topic. We're going to try to keep this to 30 or 45 minutes. If you turn on your camera, I love to see your reactions. If you don't, no worries, but I love to see it if it's resonating. If nobody turns on their camera, I have to look to Ryan, and that's my only source <laughs> of input to see if what I'm saying makes any sense. Um, question and answer at the end. Put your questions in the chat. And we're also going to go over some time-saving tools at the end. And you can always text me 24-7 for any future topics before we, while I was writing the outline for today, um, I thought maybe next time, not maybe next time, what I'd like to do is talk about municipal lien searches. There is a wealth of information to be found in a municipal lien search, and we can talk about the municipal record and the public record and the differences between the two. Hey, Jeff, having said yeah. all that, I think we're ready to launch into this thing. And I love impressing buyers and I love impressing sellers. And I love impressing realtors, but even more than I love impressing anybody is getting paid. And today's topic, as much as we want to impress a bunch of people, it's about getting paid. So if you, if you guys are in a transaction and you want to bulletproof that transaction, I'm going to give you the tools that realtors can use to bulletproof their deals. Let's see, screen share, uh, I have a brief outline that I put together. I'm going to expand upon it right after the session is over and you guys can share it with the group. Can you see it, Ryan? Yep. All right. I'm going to put this over here and I'm going to put this over here. I apologize if I'm looking away while I'm talking to you guys. It's just the way I have to set up my multiple screens. So you haven't ordered a title advance and you got a deal and it's at a title company, not ours, and they don't have title leap. And I'm going to give you some tools so that you can survive any transaction and make sure you're going to get paid. 
Three things every real estate agent must know about title commitments. Did you know any deal can die over? You can see my outline, Ryan? Yep. Yep. Let's see. Did you know any deal can die over title issues at any stage of the game? Not many agents know that. We're going to go over what that means. Yes, even the day of closing. We'll approve your hours of hard work and commissions at the time you list or make an offer. You can do that with title advance. But if you don't have your title advance, I'm going to give you the tools to do that when you're using any other title agent. What does the contract require? What is the commission road to the what is the commission roadmap? And what are the title exceptions? And then we'll go into a double bonus discussion. But I'm going to try to keep this short because I've noticed some of this stuff has drug on for a while lately. All right, what does the contract require? Look at line 155 and line 371. The contract requires, let's see, I'll just start forms, line 155. In your contract, to start off with the basics, we'll blow this up a little bit more. Very few people, very few realtors know there's a difference between the escrow agent and the closing agent. In your contract, everything is defined in the contract. And when they reuse the terms, there's going to be capitalized terms. Can you see my cursor, Ryan? Yep. Yeah, I can so see loan, loan amount is a capitalized and defined term. It's what they call a term of art. It's captured in quotes and it's in parentheses. And every time loan amount is referred to in the contract, it's going to be referred to that way. Here is where you have the definition of the escrow agent. The escrow agent is not always the closing agent. 90% of the time they are, but some old schoolers are putting escrow agents here and then closing agents leaving it to chance for no one to identify. I would tell you the best thing to do, whether you're making an offer, whether you're receiving an offer in paragraph 20 is to always define who the closing agent is. Now there's no ambiguity, one less talking point. Whoever is picking the closing agent, you put it right there in paragraph 20, capital C, capital A. It's one of the only places in the contract. Sorry if you, I get a little emotional, you guys. I love this stuff. And if I get a little emphatic, just dial me down, Ryan. You got if it, you Jim. Put it, If you put it in paragraph 20, and I'm pointing to my right screen because that's where it is, you'll never have to have that conversation during the life of your transaction. So why not write it in there? Capital C. Capital A, it's the only defined term in the contract that's used before it's defined. Every other term in the contract is defined and then it's used. The closing agent is defined after it's used. Just take my word for it. It's buried in the contract, capital C, capital A. That's who's performing the title services. The escrow agent is the one who is performing the escrow services. But you got to know that there's a difference because if you don't, like I always say, the dangerous agent isn't the agent that doesn't know the rules. The dangerous agent, what's up, Bob, is the agent who doesn't know the issues. You don't have to know the rules. You just have to know the issue, and then you can go to the contract to find the rule. All right, line 155. Line 155 is where we define who is going to choose title insurance agent. The title insurance agent is the one who's going to close the deal. The one who closes the deal is, let's see, title insurance. The one who closes the deal is usually the escrow agent, but not always the escrow agent. So as we've all seen in the contract, you select whether the seller is going to choose or whether the buyer is going to choose. The most important thing that people don't know that can kill their deal is the title insurance due date. If your title agent does not deliver the title agent, the title insurance on time, the buyer can cancel the transaction for a material default. You don't see it happen until somebody goes and finds a clever attorney and then they can do it. Then they can kill it. So that's all defined in lines 155, 156. I don't want to go into too much detail there, but I want to also bring your eye to the, to the fact that a title insurance commitment must be delivered and legible copies of the instruments listed as exceptions. That's the bonus round we're going to go in today. We're going to talk a little bit about exceptions. So if the seller is choosing title or the buyer is choosing title, it is the seller's duty to make sure that thing is delivered. Just because you have a title agent who's not watching the ball, it's not the title agent's fault. 
if the title commitment is chosen by the seller, if the title, if the closing agent is chosen by the seller and it doesn't get delivered in time, it's not the title agent's fault. There is no suing the title agent. The remedy is the buyer gets to back out. If the title agent doesn't, why is that? Ryan, why do you think that is? I don't want to put you on the spot, but let show of hands. Uh, this is an important concept. Why isn't it the title agent's fault if the title insurance doesn't get delivered on time? Why isn't it the title agent's fault? Show of hands. It's a, it's a rule. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I mean, it, it falls on the seller, right? So the seller picked title, right? So they, you know, they're the ones that are paying for the, for title. So they, you know, it's on them to make sure that the title agent is providing, you know, title within 15 minutes. The only people you can sue in the transaction, exactly. The only people who are at fault in this transaction between the buyer and the seller are the people who signed the contract. Did the title agent sign the contract? Title agent can't be sued. Now the seller might be able to sue. The, excuse me? The seller might be able to sue the title agent because they screwed up, but it's the seller's duty, right? So now you represent the buyer. The seller chose title. You have to watch all these things. Now you represent the seller and the seller chose title. You still have to watch those things, right? Because any one of these things, if you're representing the buyer and the seller fails to deliver the title insurance commitment and legible copies of the exceptions on time, the deal blows up. You've not, you know, you've, you've not done the things you need to do. And it's easy to do. Title Leap can get you to do this. You can make your own timeline. Title Leap will give you the dates. They'll serve you the dates. You don't have to watch the dates, but these are things you have to know about. It's all in the, if you look in the Title Leap app, it's all got the commitment due date and all those things. Inspection periods, loan application periods, loan approval periods. So I said something wrong there, right? I said loan application. It's a loan approval period. We all have to use the language that's defined in the contract. Loan approval period, capital A, capital L, capital A, capital P. All right, so now we've gotten that, I've beaten that dead horse. Also in the contract, in line 371, are the standards. So once you understand what has to be delivered and then and when, now in line 171, we talk about title evidence and restrictions. There are, in the standards, statements of how title has to be delivered. We can go into that later, but without going too deep down the rabbit hole, title has to be delivered in a marketable title condition. And if it's not delivered in a marketable title condition, then you have the right, the buyer has the right to object. And then you go into this period of back and forth where they have to cure the title. And if they can't cure the title, it continues on to in, 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 in the, uh, page eight. If they can't cure the title, it goes back and forth. There's 120 days. Right now your transaction is just stuck in this position. And if I think I'm getting paid in a week, I start thinking about ways to spend my money. Well, now your money's not coming to you for a lot longer. And these, Commission, here's another topic, Ryan. These commission, advanced commission settlement companies that are paying commissions to agents before deals close, we got to figure out what the remedies are because agents are relying more on more of these things. Are you guys familiar with this? Show of hands if anybody's familiar with it. You can call a company and get a loan against your expected commission. I don't know what the deal is. You know, if you if you owe the company the money, if, if the thing goes into a title objection and it gets bound up for three or four months in a title objection period. You want to get paid. You want to make sure you have a clean title. You got to know these things just because they can boomerang your deal. So there's a title standard section. Briefly, what it says is yeah. if there are objections that render title not marketable, then a buyer can object and you go into this cycle where the stuff gets reviewed. I don't want to focus on it too much because you, you don't see it very frequently, but it does happen. 
and what is what is an object what is something that a buyer can make a marketable title can make it a title objection to it's when title isn't marketable what's not marketable title marketable title is title that a reasonable buyer a reasonable sell a reasonable buyer or a reasonable lender won't accept and litigation may likely result marketable title is title that a reasonable buyer or a reasonable lender will not accept and litigation will likely result All right, now we've beaten that course for a little while. What is the commission roadmap? So, so, so the three things you got to know is what are the references in the contract and what are the due dates for what has to be delivered? Any one of those things can derail your deal. Here's the, here's the crux of title insurance. What is the commission roadmap? This, this is also known as the requirements. This is what the title agent looks at as when they order a title insurance commitment, this is what's delivered to the title insurance agency. And it's, everybody refers to it as the commitment. Mm -hmm. Title advance is a peek at what you have in the commitment. The commitment is the full Monty. It's the full blown this is what the title insurance agent is using as their guide to close the deal. What does that mean to realtors? This is your guide to make sure you can get paid. I had a realtor the other day. We sent the title advance to somebody about three months ago. And the day before closing, they called me and they said, oh, my God, there is a child support lien. And now the seller doesn't want to pay it. And they don't want to close It's for $26,000 or $27,000. And I said, wait a minute, is this address blah, blah, blah? And they said, yeah. And I said, I sent you a title advance on that two months ago, three months ago. And they said, really? I got the advance, but I didn't know how to read it. That's title work job. That's blah, you know, that's something that the title company does. And I said, well, you can always call me when you get it if you don't understand it. But that child support issue was in the title advance. And had you had the conversation, the big objection was the seller didn't have a duty to pay the child support lien. And if they had tackled the thing 60 days prior when they got the title advance, it could have been resolved. So at the day of closing, it was closing without exception, you know, without issue. But now they didn't look at it until it was actually on the settlement statement and there was a dollar value attached to it. And the seller was like, oh, hell no. And my point simply is what the realtor said to me was that's title work. We don't get involved in that. Sure it is. And I don't disagree at all. But had you known the issue existed, you could have tackled it and there would be no issue and you'd be getting your, your commission. And now they're going to put the deal in escrow for the next 60 days to resolve the child support issue. Ryan, if I get a little heated, just tell me. Yeah, no, it's good. So, I mean, there's a schedule A and the schedule B kind of just give us a, a route. Yeah. You know, so schedule to, A is who gets insured and for how much and what's getting insured. Schedule A is just a menu of who gets the insurance. I'm going to, Wendy, I'm going to send you an outline with all this stuff in it. Who gets the insurance and who is insured, uh, who, who's insured, how much, and what property. So here you have the loan amount for the owner's policy. Can you see my cursor, Ryan? Yep. If I could blow it up more, I would. No, it's pretty clear, Jim. There you go. Who gets the insurance right here and how much. Then you have the loan policy. We're not going to go into rating or costing or pricing, but this is the loan policy. So the original policy goes to the insured, who's the buyer. The loan policy goes to the lender. I'm going to just say something. You don't have to memorize this. Title insurance only exists because lending exists. <laughs> title insurance is, is not for buyers. Title insurance is for lenders. When you close a deal, the buyer brings 40 grand. The lender brings 400 grand. Who has the most skin in the game? The title insurance agent. Just keep that in the back of your mind. You know, everybody says it's for buyers. No, it's for lenders, but the buyers get the collateral benefit. So then you have the 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 simultaneous, uh, the endorsements that are going to be issued. Don't worry about that from a title agent, per, from a realtor perspective. Fee simple, duly appointed garden. So these are the people that are in title on the day of the sale. And then this is the land that's going to be conveyed in the day of the sale. The title insurance commitment and the survey 
in the deed of record must match. You don't have to know this, but just, you don't have to check this, but just understand in the back of your mind, all three instruments have to match. If they don't match, there's a problem with the deal. It's not gonna close on time, potentially. By B1 are the requirements. This is your actual commission roadmap. This is the thing we talked about in the second bullet point of the outline. Everything on this list has to be satisfied for closing. Everything on this list, the title agent has to resolve for closing. If you remember nothing else about what we talked about today, the big takeaway from the discussion is if you have the time and if you desire to ensure your deal, take a quick look at B1. It's going to be overwhelming the first time you look at it. But if you look at them over time, no, two things. You got to make sure the title agent hits their deadlines. You got to know what the critical dates are for title because that can kill your deal. And if you and if you are the bulletproof realtor who wants to make sure you get your commission, look at the B1 schedule. B1 is what has to be done for closing. Two main things, the dates and what has to occur on those dates. So in this, you're going to see a bunch of standards. This is a standard. Um, the proposed insured must notify the commandment and revenue is done prior to not refer to this commitment who will obtain it. So you just have to have an accurate contract. The title agent has to pay the fees to the title insurance underwriter. This is our list of what we have to do as a title agent. We have to pay the premiums charged for the policy by the company. Now, here's where we start. Those are standards. Here's where we start getting into the meat of what has to be done. A deed has to be provided and a mortgage has to be provided from these parties. Typically, it's just going to say a deed, a warranty deed from Ryan Poole to Jim Brown. But if there are defects in title, like somebody in a probate who didn't get named in transactions prior from a seller three deals ago, that's going to show up here in the title conveyance requirements, which is typically number four. But when you see it, you'll know it because it's just going to say a deed from Ryan to Jim. But it might say a deed from Ryan to Jim. And it might say a quick claim deed from Wendy to Jim for the probate where Wendy was omitted years ago. So it's the chain of title. It's looking at the chain of title, you know, through the whole transaction. I mean, it goes, how back, far back does it go to the 30 years title? under the marketable market record title, title act. Marta is 30 years. So the chain 30 goes years. back 30 years. The search goes back 30 years under a rule called Marta, M-A-R-T-A. -A. Um, this, this is going to typically be one sentence unless there are issues that have to be cleaned up. Why do you care about that? Because if they're looking for a stray deed or a probate has to be re reconducted or any number of things that can potentially delay closing, do you bring it to your buyer's attention? No. Do you bring it to your seller's attention? No. You call your title agent and say, hey, what the heck are you guys going to do about this? Are we getting ahead of the ball? Love it. Update the title search. This is a standard. This is just says we're going to do an update. There's a gap in the public record between the time we order the commitment and the time we close the deal. We just have to close that gap. There's a whole bunch of details I can get into on that. So let me ask you this quick question, Jim. You know, yeah. that last title search, because I had this come up, I got one of my buyers got scammed on a deal. When does that last title search, searching the public records occur? Is it like the day before closing? The morning yeah, uh, you're supposed the to do an update. Modern modern TPS, modern title processing software has an update button, update title button. So you can hit the button as you're walking into the closing room. Danny can tell you more about that. You can hit the button as you're walking into the closing room and close the gap as tightly as you can. There's still a gap, but you're going to narrow it. Well, so so just, just so you know, guys, like and this is why it's important. I had a, I had a buyer that I was representing. We had a deal to contract. We're going to the day of, day of closing. And literally, either it was the day before or I think it was the day of, the son, who was a scam artist, produced a quick claim deed that his father, who owned, you know, we were buying the house from, had sold it, quick claimed the house to the son. So we went and closed, and then all of a sudden, 
there's this quick claim deed that shows up miraculously on the day of closing and I go to secure the property after closing and there's the son going, what are you doing in my house? Had that happen? Well, Had here's the, what you bring up is a really good point, Ryan, and that is title agents are supposed to update title as close to the time of signing as possible. Yes. Not all title agents do it. And if they don't do it, then you could have a deal where there's something that shows up in what they call the gap. The gap is the, 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 the gray period between the last time they searched and, and the day of closing. It's usually about two, two and a half weeks and everybody signs an affidavit at closing. But if something gets recorded in that gap and they don't do an update, then that's a real problem because the title insurance underwriter won't back up the title company. And if the title company doesn't have sufficient funds to do it on their own, then you may have a deal that can never close. And, and there's a whole bunch of rules that surround the gap. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too deep. I just want to give you guys the basics. But that's yeah. an essential thing that title agents have to do. And if they don't do it, you have a deal that may never close. And I can give you a million examples of that. So they're going to update the search. That's a standard. And now here, you guys, this is so there's two things on here that are important. The deeds and what have to get signed for the closing and what has to get paid off. Why is that important to you? Because this is going to be your roadmap to equity. If there's equity, it equals commission. If there's no equity, commission in jeopardy. That means, <laughs> that means buyers are bringing okay. money to the table to close. <laughs> Buyers don't like to bring money to the table, whether the it's sellers, the sellers, Jim, the I'm, sellers don't want to, yeah, the I'm sellers. Sorry. Sellers are bringing money. Buyers are always bringing money. I'm getting too excited. Yeah. Sellers are bringing money to close. Sellers don't like to bring a nickel. They certainly don't like to bring five grand. And I had a seller bring 150 grand the other day because they were a high net worth seller and they knew ahead of time that there was going to be equity. How did they know ahead of time there was going to be equity? There was going to be negative equity. They had a title advance. The seller had lots of money. They worked for FPL. They were relocating from Florida to some other big utility company. And you know, it's a seller that makes a hundred grand or that makes a million bucks a year. They're an executive at FPL. And the and the thought of bringing 150 grand to closing, and they were like, Yeah, what do I got to do? But they set that expectation at the time of listing because they had a title advance. But this is going to be what's on the title advance. This is what's in the commitment. There is a satisfaction of a mortgage as a book and page in the book and page, if the commitment doesn't call out who the lender is, the book and page is in this particular one, they tell you who the lender is or who the servicer is. Here you have the satisfaction of, oh, a second mortgage. Guess who <laughs> didn't know they had a second mortgage? The seller, I'll tell you why in a minute. And then here you have a dismissal of a court action with Liz Pendants that tells you that the first mortgage is in default because somebody filed a Liz pendants. We can talk about Liz pendences for an hour. Liz pendences are what get filed when title is in dispute. In a foreclosure, title is in dispute. A Liz pendants equals foreclosure, nine times out of 10. And then you have proper proof that estate taxes were paid. That's not a big deal for you guys. You have another, whenever you see record satisfaction, that's something that has to get paid, nine times out of, 99 times out of 100. Um, so this is liens against a person with a common name. When I sell property as Jim Brown, James Brown, there are probably 300 James Brown, 200 James Browns in Palm Beach County that have judgments against them. None of them are me, <laughs> but the title insurance commitment is going to have a list of judgments against a guy named James Brown that I have to sign an affidavit that says these aren't me. Do you have to have that conversation with your client? Absolutely not. Just know in the back of your mind, if you have a client with a common name, there could be a lot of judgments and people freak out, but the reality is they're not them and they just have to sign an affidavit that says they're not them. Can they lie? Yes. Is it a reflection on you if they lie? No, but they do lie all the time and we find that. Um, Survey. There's going to be a survey that's needed. This is a single family home. Can you close without a survey in any situation? Absolutely. Yes. Unless you have a lender, the lender is always going to require a survey. So if you have a cash purchase, there will be a survey requirement, but the buyer does not have to buy a survey. They just won't get title insurance over the survey, which we'll go over in a second. Uh, taxes were paid. Uh, they want to review. This is a particularly messy one. 
So they want to review the guardian the guardianship proceedings. The the title insurance underwriter wants us to send them copies of the guardianship. Bing, 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 bing. You don't know anything about guardianships, but you're going to talk to the title agent and say, "Hey, do you guys have the, the guardianship docs?" And they're going to make they're going to call the realtor and say, "Hey, do you have the guardianship?" I'm sorry, they're going to call the parties and say, "Hey, send us copies of the guardianship docs." You don't want to be the bad guy. You just want to know what's going on and make sure the title agent's ahead of the ball. This is it, you guys. I pulled out one of the most messy title insurance commitments I've seen in three years. To use as an example, yours is not going to be as messy as this one, but this is a good example because it rolls out. Brent, Brent is a licensed title insurance agent. He can tell you this is a messy one. Um, review the guardianship. So you're going to want to make sure that's lined up. Regard, regard an order authorizing sale. So this transaction can't close until the court has issued an order authorizing sale. Um, execution, this is a stand- Because it's in foreclosure, right? Because there's a list pendants. Not in this particular one, the seller was an estate. Okay. So if it, it is a, can you sell? So there's a good question, Ryan. Can you sell a property subject to a foreclosure without a court order? Yes. Is the buyer buying a bag of potential problems? Yeah, but if you're a sophisticated buyer, you might do that. Have I sold property subject to a foreclosure? Yes, I bought property personally subject to a foreclosure. Can you sell property without a uh, without a order of the court in probate? You could, but you never should. You could do it. You could buy anything. If you're getting it cheap enough, we got a guy in Lake Worth who's buying vacant lots, homes burned down, subject to a order for, what do you call it when the when the properties are, so subject to an order of condemnation. He's getting $200,000 worth of property for about 40 grand, but he knows what he's doing and he knows how to clean everything up and the seller just wants out. It's subject to a probate. It's subject to a whole bunch of stuff. Can you do it? But you got to just you just got to know the risks. But these are advanced stuff. We can talk about if anybody wants to text me. Closing funds must be dispersed by the direction of the title agency under this policy. So here's one that's obvious, right? These are the standards. I can't get it to highlight. This just says on the day of closing, we got to disperse the money as directed in the settlement statement. Those are the requirements. You'll know they're the requirements at the top of the page because it's going to say requirements. That's what the title agent must do to close the sale. You don't have to know what every requirement is, but if you scan this quickly, you're going to see what deeds have to be passed. And hopefully it's just a deed from Jim to Frederico. And you're going to see the, the record satisfactions. Those are the two things that should stick out in your head. Deeds that have to be drafted and things that have to be satisfied. If there's a code violation on there, here's a question, here's a trick question. If there's a code violation, if there's a code violation, will it show up in the title insurance report? What has to happen before a code violation ends up in the title insurance commitment? It has to be turned into a lien. Code violations exist in the municipal lien search, which we'll go over next time we meet. Liens show up in the commitment, code violations, open permits, things like that do not show up in the commitment until a judge passes an order and a lien results. Now the lien is on real property and not just in the municipal records for that municipality. So if a code violation officer goes to a property and they tag it and they say your grass is long and you have abandoned cars, that never shows up in a title commitment until you don't clean up the mess and a judge says, now you get a lien. Here is the title commitment um, exceptions. You'll know they're the exceptions because it says right at the top, exceptions from coverage. I'm going to put this in the outline. You don't have to write it down. Two rules for title insurance exceptions. The first one is title insurance, unlike hazard insurance, 
insures for things that happened in the past. If you buy a house and you get a hazard insurance policy and you get a light, you buy a house Monday and the lightning strikes it Tuesday, you have a claim on Wednesday. The event happened after you bought the policy. If your policy says we don't cover for lightning strikes, we only kept cover for vandalism and fire and flood, you have an exception from coverage for lightning. That's what's going to show up here. These are the things that are not covered by your title insurance policy. They're exceptions from coverage. Think of it like your hazard insurance policy that doesn't cover lightning, right? These are all the things that aren't covered. And now, if they're not covered, that's the first rule. The second rule is if they're not covered, it's all going to be in the outline, but you don't have to know this is just kind of like advanced stuff. This is bonus stuff. That's why I called it on the outline. I call this bonuses. What are the exceptions? But I'm going to give you one example of when exceptions can be important. And you can text me 24 seven and we'll go over it. Um, let's see. Yeah. If the exception applies to all the properties in your community, it does not matter to you. If the exception only applies to your property, it matters to you. Not from a commission perspective, and when I say you, I mean from a buyer's perspective, but if it matters to the buyer, it could matter to you. And I'll give you an example in a minute. The example of what applies to every property in the community is, say you're in a PUD, a planned unit development, and there is an, there is a easement for, um, there's an easement for utilities. That utilities easement runs over every single property. Do you care about it? Not really. Does a buyer care about it? It covers every property. It's an exception from coverage. You can't build your pool in it. So from a surveyor perspective, you want to know where it is. And if your buyer tells you, hey, I want to build a pool in the backyard, you would say, you know, well, let's get a survey. It's a cash deal, but let's get a survey to make sure you always want to have a survey. If you're spending more than five grand on property, you always want to have a survey. But, an ex but a utility easement does not matter to the buyer because it applies to every property in the community. So what's an example of something that would matter? So these are all standards again, and this is all the things that the title agent's gonna to do to cure it. These are all standards. Here's an example of an easement. This is an exception from coverage. Here is an example of an exception that applies. This is the one example I can think of in all of Palm Beach County. Well, there's a couple, but this well, is the one. You guys, do I think not... your mic is uh, cutting me out a little bit there. My mic? I can hear you. I can hear him. Okay. That might be me. Sorry. Yeah, I think it was you because when you were speaking, it was broken up. You guys, don't, don't like vapor lock over this. Just know that if there is a oil and mineral gas, oil, gas, and mineral exception, right? It's called a reservation on property, you see this in Wellington and almost all the deals, it applies to lots and lots of properties, but it may really concern your buyer. So there are a bunch of savvy attorneys in Palm Beach County out West, and there's even some savvy realtors. If the mineral, so what does this mean? It means that I'm gonna just say that, go through this real quick. Mineral rights and gas reservations mean that somebody has rights to excavate below the surface of the land or at the surface of the land, water, sand, oil, all those things. If they have the right of entrance, that's a problem. If they don't have the right of entrance, that just means they can bore under your land and extract the minerals and gas and water. So here, where it says affected by this agreement not to exercise right of ingress and egress to explore, mine, and develop without permission of the then surface owner. This has been a big issue lately. So if you're selling property or buying property, I don't expect you to memorize these rules, but if you have oil and gas reservations, whether it's our deal or anybody else's, text me and we'll figure out whether they have the rights of exploration or not. Your buyer does not want to buy property on Monday if Tuesday somebody can set up 
an extraction facility in their living room. But if they're going to bore under your property and take oil, gas, and water, you don't care. So that's the one exception that applies to lots of properties you may care about. You also may have exceptions for things like ordinances that, that prohibit three-story buildings or you know, any number of different things that municipalities think are important to the municipality. The exceptions, I don't expect you guys to remember this stuff. It's just something you have to know is an exception from coverage. I don't expect you to remember the, the oil and gas mineral reservations issues, but they come up. We know how to tackle them. Um, I know how to read the, the reservations. Rebecca's joining us on our legal team. She knows how to, to read the reservations. Um, she's on the call today. The exceptions are the exceptions from coverage, the requirements or what you need to know to close your deal. That's the important stuff. And everything else is gravy. You don't have to read anything. If you want to read something, you would read the requirements. So what would you recommend on this? I have had, you know, you know, in my 20 year career, a couple of different things come up on the commitment that the buyers did question, right? And I've actually used you, Jim. You know, I said, hey, let's 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 use Just an attorney. Text me 24-7. Yeah. Yeah. Use use an attorney to review the commitment. That's outside of I honestly, you know, the title agent, right? If you're representing yeah. the buyer. And then, you know, he can ask the questions to the title company to clear up any of these issues that could come up or have some clarity on them. A million deals close, right? And there's never an issue. It's the one deal that closes where there's an issue and there's never an issue to there's an issue. And, and I get people that I've closed with for years and they say, you know, nothing's ever come up. And then something comes up and they're like, oh my God, now I get it. What's up, Pablo? Well, I remember that. I don't know if you remember that property we have in West Palm Beach that the lady bought and closed and in the title, uh, in the, the closed with the bank with a mortgage, and in the title, it was an exception that it was some, the one we talked last week, it was like a, some open violation for the city, like the seller is supposed to close. Yeah. And I didn't close, and the, um, the seller didn't close it, and they closed the transaction, right? They closed the transaction, and we absolutely caught it entirely. Uh, and, uh, and then she had uh, some entire advance. Um, she actually had like three hundred thousand dollars that she was on, because she had that, the no the fake in the title, they sneaked that stuff in the title, and it shouldn't be there, right? I don't even know how that closed. Well, we had what Pablo was talking about was, a, I believe, the one you're bringing up is a transaction mm -hmm. where the title agent and the seller were in bed together, and they snuck yes. a exception <laughs> in the they snuck an issue into the exceptions. And the transaction closed. And so the law says, if you close with notice, then you've accepted title and it's as is state. So what does that mean? It's an advanced concept, but everybody says, oh no, there's title insurance, so we're covered. Well, if the exception to title insurance is for the ordinance that Pablo's referring to, or the, I think it was, a, wasn't it a, a property that had Unpermitted improvements or something? No, it was it was something with the gate. And it was something simple with the gate. So they listed uh, the issue in the exception section. So now when they delivered the title commitment, the buyer took title with notice, right? They took notice, they took title with notice of the exception. Let's just say that the title commitment in the exception section has a mortgage, right? It's not proper but they conveyed title with the mortgage in place. And now the buyer took title and there's no title insurance over the mortgage. Does it happen? Very, very, very rarely, but it does happen. You have title agents that forget about stuff at the last minute and they put it in the exceptions section. They take it out of the requirements. They put it in the exceptions and now you're buying the property subject to that issue. Because why? You're on notice, you didn't object. There is an objection section in the contract. The contract says, if you don't like title, it says buyers and sellers, mainly buyers, if you don't like the quality of title you're receiving, you sent us an objection within five days of the receipt of the title commitment. 
You know, the, oh, the funny thing is, I don't, I don't know how the sleep on the into the crack is. Also, the bank nobody didn't knows notice. how to read it, but I don't expect <laughs> realtors to read it. Yeah. Buyers need to read it, right? Did realtors sign the contract? No, so realtors can't be reliable for the buyer's screw up. You just want to make sure you get paid, so you got to make sure that this stuff exists or is satisfied or gets taken care of. It's just a punch list item on your calendar. You don't need to so do it. Makes, let me ask you this question, Jim: Who makes the determination if it's a requirement? or an exception, who's making that determination? So it's a marketable title issue, right? So you don't wanna buy title where where title, the, the seller is under a duty to sell property with marketable title. It's a really big rabbit hole we can get into. Let's just say that everybody expects to buy property that's not subject to a defect. It's a reasonable expectation. You have a title insurance agent, you have things that, but there are subtle shades of gray that move issues from requirements to exceptions. So we just went into a complicated one. I'll give you the example again. It's the oil and gas minerals reservations. I have no problem buying property with oil and gas mineral reservations, but I have a property problem buying a piece of property for me personally, if the person who holds the reservation has the has the right to walk onto my property at any time and open a mining operation in my living room. <laughs> and, well, you laugh, but I can tell you an example of a transaction. So there's a prominent law firm downtown. I was representing a buyer of real property and FPNL had a reservation, an easement. It just said reservation to make improvements to the property. The reservation was, it was listed as an exception, right? So it's not a covered event under title insurance. The reservation had existed for 110 years. The property had transferred title, how many times? 10 times, 20 times? One of the attorneys for the seller was one of the most prominent attorneys in Palm Beach County. I don't wanna call him out by name. And I objected to the FPNL reservation. The FPNL reservation, if you took the time to read it, said that the seller, that FPNL, third party, so you have a transaction from buyer to seller to buyer, it said a third party, FPNL, had the right to go in, erect infrastructure, poles, lines, and utility boxes in, in any location at their discretion. The, the, the property had changed hands 10 times in 100 years. Nobody objected to it. The seller of the, the attorney for the seller was the attorney when that seller made the purchase. And now I said, we're not buying and we're objecting the title because FPNL has the right to go in there and set up a utility infrastructure any place they want, any time they want. And then everybody was furious. The bank, including the bank, was willing to lend. It was warehouses. You close on Monday, and FPNL wakes up on Tuesday and says, ah, eh, we want to build an infrastructure on Wednesday. They demo the whole property and set up whatever they want, and the bank now has no collateral. Everybody was asleep at the wheel. It happens. So I told the, the seller's attorney, close the, sell, clean this thing up, and we'll close. That's an extreme example, you guys. The, the mm -hmm. only takeaway you guys need to, to, to walk away from this thing with, if you ever come back to the podcast again, because Jim's a raving lunatic, the only takeaway you got to remember is the requirements, right? But you should also know what Schedule A is, like Brian was, like Brian was saying, so that you know who's got the coverage and you know who's in title. And, the, and you know those issues. You don't check it. But if you want to check anything, you check the requirements to make sure there isn't. So here's a good example of why you check the requirements. I'm going to keep this brief for 50 minutes. And anybody who wants to drop off, I won't be insulted. But this is a great example because you're going to see this more and more as COVID forbearances roll through. The buyer couldn't, the, the owner, the seller couldn't pay their mortgage. The seller called their lender and said, hey, I want to get a forbearance. Or they were contacted by the lender and said, I see you haven't paid. Do you want a forbearance? What's a forbearance? That means that they're going to pause the payments under a structure, restructure the loan, and resume payments. So this, the, the seller qualified for a forbearance. The 
lender sent a stack of documents in typical lender fashion and said, sign these. The seller signed all the documents. The payments resumed. They had a $250,000 mortgage. If Tajay is listening, he'll know the values right off the top of his head. I don't see him on the Zoom. So they had a two, the seller was under the impression at the sale, they had a $250,000 mortgage. One mortgage. All they signed when they bought the house was 250 grand. In this particular transaction, and in many transaction transactions, the original lender, I think, was PNC. PNC contacted HUD and said, hey, we need some money for the forbearance. In the stack of documents the seller signed was a second mortgage to HUD for the forbearance amount. Wow. In the stack of documents the seller signed at 9 o'clock at night after they got off of work and they were high-fiving their spouse, we got our more, we got our, we're going to keep our house, they signed a second mortgage. So they're signing, signing, signing. They have no idea what they're signing. They send it back to the lender. The lender records a second mortgage. When you read the type, title commitment, you'll see it right here. Other than that, the seller had no clue they had a, a um, second mortgage. The value of the second mortgage on top of the first mortgage, I wish Tajay was on. He could tell me the exact value. I believe it was $80,000. So instead of a 250 payoff with a little balloon on the end of it for the re for the forbearance, which is what you typically see, this was the $250,000 payoff, 250, they got the payoff, 250 grand, had an $80,000 balloon. Now the property is upside down. You won't so get paid. <laughs> you won't get paid if you're an agent. No one's getting paid. And this deal took six months. The realtors and I have all lost hair in this deal. And they just it's the deal that just keeps giving. But the but the point I'm trying to make is when you when you when you're having the, some realtors have the equity conversation with the sellers and some don't. Somebody on this podcast right now had a listing on Saturday. On Monday, I sent them a title advance and I said, Hey, the value of the mortgages appears to exceed your listing value. They didn't request it. I just saw the listing came live and I sent it to them automatically. And so they had the conversation with the seller and, and you don't have to speak up, but you know who you are. And so those are the things that you need to do because otherwise they would have worked for the next 60 days without equity. And then when the, and when the title company finally got the commitment out, everybody would have said, oh my God, this can't close. There's no equity. I believe the scenario was the seller thought they had two mortgages, but in fact, the seller had three. In this particular situation that I'm talking about here, these COVID forbearances, if the rule is, if they are funded by HUD, which the seller never knows who funds their forbearance, it will be a second mortgage. It will have a value. Forbearances have a balloon value. If you had a 250 mortgage, you didn't make payments for two years, there might be a $20,000 balloon. So the payoff isn't 250, it's 270. If HUD financed the balloon, if HUD financed the forbearance, now you got a first mortgage and a second mortgage but your seller is always going to tell you I only have one. All right. I hope everybody's got deal fatigue by now. Double bonus. How do you control guard title, regardless of whether you are a buyer or a seller's agent and use title advance in all your offers? We beat that one to death, but I go back to the contract. We talked about the escrow agent. We talked about the closing agent. If you're making offers on properties and you ordered a title advance, and you want to control title because you think we did a good job in paragraph 20 right here you write the the closing agent capital c capital a the closing agent is new path title and then you give our address and contact information now you'll get title advance you can contact me 24 7 and we can walk you through the deal or whatever comes up and you'll control title and your buyer and seller will think you're a rock star because title leap works so well and we get the benefit of all the stuff we offer. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Are you still looking <laughs> at my screen, Ryan? Is it still? No, off? I get it. It's amazing, Jim. I mean, wow, this has been so in depth. This is like, you know, you're, you know, how many years as a real estate? 40 term, years. Over 20, 20 years. years as a practicing consolidated agent. here to less than an hour. 
you know, on title commitments. It's been like a big black box for me, you know, for years. And to actually have you go through it here line by line is so valuable, Jim. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all the agents for attending. We host this biweekly webinar to add value to make your lives easier, right? Share information, help close deals, help get paid and help your buyers and sellers, right? So again, my name is Ryan Poole. I'm a real estate agent, just like yourself. I've been doing it 20, over 20 years. And I'm the founder of Real Trade online marketplace and social media platform for real estate, the home of the double dip. Definitely want you to check out, create a free profile. Not only can you get free leads off your listings, you can connect with other agents and awesome service providers like Jim and like Jeff here on the call that can help you either on your lending or on your title work. And I definitely want to give a big shout out to you, Jim. You know, I use Jim for my closings. One big, huge reason I use that is because of his software title lead. It's like a free contract coordinator, guys, for your closings that keep track of all those drop dead dates, including the title commitment that we just that we just spoke of, spoke about. And I use Title Advance on all my listings, and also too, if it's if, if my buyer and I'm I'm working on a deal that I think is going to have some hair on it, definitely get a free Title Advance. So check that out. So Jim, you want to you want to end us here on this one? Yeah, you can get Title Advance at TitleAdvance.io. There's no cost to realtors. If you find hair on the thing, if there's issues you want to talk about, you just text me 24 seven. We'll walk through it. Only make, I say win listing appointments because you're the most prepared agent and make only make offers on properties with clean title. If you have buyers that have time constraints, you got to make sure you're not going to have a problem title. MV realty liens are lean real. Um, COVID forbearance, second mortgages are real. Pace and Y green loans are real. And then we have new path title. Where's new path title up here. Here's Title Leap, our product, and not sharing your oh. screen. You're not sharing your screen. I'm not. You guys, when I was showing you the real trade stuff, that wasn't coming up. No. No, that's fine. We saw that. We we saw your outline the whole time, Jim. Yeah, well, there's. You guys are looking at the real trade page, right? Yes, I can see it. Yes, yep. we can see real trade right now. Here's titleadvance.io. If you go to the very bottom of titleadvance.io, you can actually order title insurance commitments. If you order a title insurance, if you get a title advance that looks messy and you text me, we'll have a conversation. If you order the title insurance commitment, I will credit you back the cost of the commitment at closing. So you have something that's a mess like the one we just looked at, the title advance can't reveal all that stuff. You order a commitment, you pay for the commitment, 175 bucks. When you close, I'll pay you back the 175. So you'll get our roadmap. We'll use it for the closing. Um, and there's Title Leap. Title Leap is, like Ryan said, it's a contract coordinator. And there's New Path Title. You can also order title commitments and, and uh, title advances on New Path Title. Anybody have any questions? Oh, Negative. Awesome, awesome job. I mean, it's Either just like we went into the weeds on title commitments, but it's something us ages now we can be more informed, right? For our buyers, our buyers and sellers, especially our buyers, and we can head off, you know, any kind of issues at the pass, as they say, right? Ryan, what are the two big takeaways? I'm going to put you on the spot. What are the two big takeaways? I mean, you, I mean, the biggest takeaway on the title commitments check out if you know order title advance, right? So if there is a second lien on the property that no one's aware of, you know, you can definitely save yourself some massive headaches, you know, right. Two at big that takeaways. Point. Forbearance. The the the, what's that? Forbearance. They could get into a second mortgage and the sellers never know if they do have second or third mortgages. Yeah. The big, big, the two big takeaways I want you guys to take away from this session the critical dates in the contract for the title responsibilities and the requirements page of the contract of the commitment. Mm -hmm. the critical dates and the requirements in the commitment. If you remember those two things, you've tackled 99% of the issues that title issues. All right. It's awesome. been a pleasure, you guys. It's nice to see some new faces. Kill it. Send us some deals. Text me if you need support. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Thanks, guys.